you doing? It's very exciting to be up here again. It feels like a while since I've been up here, but uh, it's probably not. Uh, I do announcements. Uh, you've probably seen them. Not awesome. But today is going to be awesome because I get to speak about someone that's very close to my heart, and that's the rewards and responsibility of family. That is not my family. I don't know whose family it is. They need to be more responsible than that. But we're going to be talking about family, and if I can actually get through this without crying, I'll be amazed because family is super important to me. It is, without doubt, the most important thing in my life and always has been the most important thing. Now, I want to start by saying I know that for some people, family is a really tough topic and it's something you don't like talking about, and I understand that. And I'm hoping that through this message, which is almost a testimony, I hope that the Holy Spirit can talk to you in some way and help you through what you're going through if family is tough for you. But for me, it hasn't ever been like that. My family is incredible. Um, my family, will we we're from England, and we came out here when I was 10 months old. We're from a place called Southampton. And my parents knew nobody when they came to Australia. This is my family. That's my mum and dad and my two brothers and me. And they knew nobody when they came to Australia. They came to Australia to start a new life for us. My oldest brother, the one in green there, he is uh, an asthmatic. And they said it'd be good to go to a dry continent like Australia to get away from wheezing. <laughs> so uh, we moved from Southampton and we came here to Australia. We lived in Smithfield in the hostels, which are the, in uh, what are called Nissan huts and they're the half rainwater tank. And we lived in them for a while and then we got a, a half house in Elizabeth Downs and uh, I stayed there until I was five years old. But my family meant everything to me. And mum and dad worked really hard to give us everything that we needed in life. We moved from uh, Elizabeth Downs to our first house in Gawler East and there we, I've basically lived there my whole life since. Um, I went to school at Gawler High and that sort of thing. Mum and Dad protected us, they cared for us. I knew that if I was ever in trouble and being the youngest, I was usually had a bit of a smarter mouth than the other two because I knew they'd stick up for me and protect me. So we had a great life living in Gawler. Um, in 1989, I met Anna, my wife, <laughs> and... Uh, why are you laughing? You look like her, mate. That's terrible to laugh. But that was us in, well, that was probably was in 89, but it was a bit later on. But that was us. We met in 1989 at a place called Monash Playground, if you ever know where that is. That one, we went to that one, not the Mamby Pamby one you see today. We went to the one that could actually kill you. It was, honestly, it was, it was, it was ridiculous. If you went there in summer, you'd lose about four layers of skin going down that slide. If you look closely at the bottom of that slide, there's a dude with his leg hanging out. He's about to come off. I mean, it's, it was a death trap. And that's where we met. And I saw Anna on that round thing fall on someone. And I thought, I like her a lot. So <laughs> we got together and, uh, and we got married eventually. And then we have the wonderful family that I have today. And I am so blessed. I mean, I look at what Lockie did last week and what Tony did this morning. And it just, I am so blessed to have God working in their lives. It's not off of our experience, it's off of what God's doing in their life. And it's an incredible thing. And as I said, I know it sounds, for people, conversation about family is tough. And I know for me, family conversation was tough for so long. Because while I was completely blessed with a, a wonderful biological family that brought us out here and did whatever they could for us, and then I met Anna, the woman of my dreams, who isn't here today, unfortunately, she's got a migraine. Other than that, she didn't want to see me preach, I don't know. <laughs> but she's not here. And then I have wonderful children. And all the while this is happening, there was another son that I had when I was 16 year old. That's my wonderful family now with Lily in it, which is fantastic. But I have this guy, Scott. So Scott, while I'm living almost a lie in my mind about this wonderful family I had, there's this guy, Scott, who was born when I was 17 years old and not to Anna. And his mother took him away and they went uh, to Victoria. And I had no dealings in this guy's life for 18 years. He didn't know who I was. I didn't know who he was. I knew he was there, but I knew nothing about it. And Anna used to say to me, you've got to contact him. You've got to contact him. And I wanted to, but was unable to. Laws wouldn't allow me to contact him. Then one day out of the blue, he rings me and he said, Hi, Dad, this is Scott. 
And I said, wow, that's unbelievable. Good to hear from you, Scott. And he said, um, I'm, I'm back in Adelaide and uh, I'd like to catch up and meet with you. Now, I thought he was away, but for a long time of his life, he was living on uh, Kidman, no, what's the road here? Ridley, Ridley Road. So just down here at the roundabout. He lived there for about 12 years with his grandmother that I didn't even know about. We were in the same blooming neighbourhood. Anyway, so 18, he said, can we meet? I said, yep. So we met at the Elizabeth City Centre there over the road and uh, it was the weirdest thing I've ever done in my life. There's this young guy with tattoos and white hair and I walked up to him and I said, oh, g'day, mate, you look like you're waiting to meet someone you've never met before. And you should, he stood up, he was like, oh, he didn't know what to do. We got talking, we had a great chat, but it was the same time, Locke and Tonya came along at the centre with Mum while I'm sitting there having a chat to them, and they didn't even know about Scott. I kept it a secret for them because I didn't want to hurt them. I didn't want them to think that their dad was a dud and couldn't look after his child. And they came along, so we just introduced them. Anyway, when they finally found out, uh, you, can you imagine, honestly, these guys not knowing anything, oh, this is your brother. Oh, great. Thanks for that. But because they're such awesome people, they prayed for Scott constantly. And because of that, Scott's been coming to church now, which is an incredible thing. Family is really important. I've got to go to my notes. I'm so thankful that I get the chance to do it, to be his father. Do you know, one of the first conversations I remember was Scott, we were driving in the car, and at the end of every sentence, he said, Dad. The weather's good, isn't it, Dad? I like your car, Dad. Where are we going, Dad? It's a fun day today, Dad. It's really good to see you. Everything was down. And I said to him, mate, you like using the word Dad? And he said, I haven't been able to use it for 18 years. And now I get the chance to do it. 18 years, never called anybody Dad. Under his tough facade, as you've seen him, I mean, he's got more tattoos on his face now. Under that tough facade of Scott was someone who was crying out for family, someone who was crying out to be cared for and loved and to be able to love somebody else. Deep within all of us, we all have that because it's God's plan from the very beginning that we live in family. Genesis 1, 26, 27 says, Then gets, God said, let us make man in our own image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish in the sea and over the birds of heaven and over the livestock and over all the earth and every creeping thing that creeps on earth. So God made man in his own image and in the image of God he was created, male and female, he created them. And God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds and of heaven and every, every living thing that moves on earth. From the very beginning, God created man to be in family. And not just to be in family, but to succeed, to have everything that we needed to rule over it and procreate and have family. God's meant for man to be in family. And that's the very thing, that very time when that happens, the enemy came to destroy God's plan. God's greatest creation is us and he wanted us to live in family and the enemy from day one has been destroying it. He got in Eve's ear, didn't he, in the garden? And he said, did God really say? And that caused doubt. And then she got in Adam's ear and that caused doubt. And from that on, that time on, the fall of man started, the fall of family started. And it's been going on ever since. You know, the world cries out for family. Yet at the same time, it's simultaneously destroying family. You know, we went to the movies last night and two of the films that are coming up is The Fast and Furious 337. I don't know what number it is now. <laughs> And that talked about, I'm going to get your family, who weren't his natural family. They were just his family. I'm going to get your family. And he said, I will fight and do whatever I can to protect my family. Two clips later, it was a guardian of the galaxy. Exactly the same thing. All these misfits came together to be family, to protect the galaxy. The world is crying out for, for family. Yet at the same time, it's absolutely destroying God's plan. Over the last decade or so, or two decades, you don't have to look far to see it happening. When I was a part of Dads for Kids, uh, during that time, they were taking the rights away from fathers in family. The New South Wales government wanted to take the name father off of birth certificates and put on um, partner, take father out of the picture altogether and put on partner. Uh, and it's been happening for ages. Like, you know, um, there's a breakdown of the family law. The family law says now that in the case of divorce, there should be equal shared parenting, parenting 
where right now, under the Albanese government, he's trying to change that. They're actually trying to rewrite the family law to take any remaining suggestion of equal share responsibility or, cons responsibility or consideration of significant time with their children as, farmer, as fathers out of the law. So they're trying to take the responsibility of fathers out of the law right now. And even though every significant study will show you that children thrive and do much better where both parents are present in a loving family with them. And now we have all this gender stuff, don't we? Where men can be women, women can be blokes. It's breaking down the moral fibre of family. Men can dress up like women, enter women's sports and compete against them in the same thing, which is absolute nonsense, in my opinion. I could go on. I won't because, <laughs> because I won't. <laughs> But it is destroying, the, it affects women, it affects mothers, this gender equality stuff. It's, it's not good for women. And we see that happening all the time. Today, people's view on marriage has changed so much uh, from the past that it, uh, it changes the way people see marriage. People go into marriage these days thinking, well, if it doesn't work, that's okay. I'll just get out of it. It doesn't matter. There's a law now called the no blame clause, where if you've had enough of your marriage, you walk out and nobody's to blame anymore. And that's really sad. In 2021, 56,244 Australians ended divorce in, and in those cases, 47.8 of them affected children directly. None of these marriages lasted longer than 15 years. Hear me when I say, if you've been in a, a broken marriage, there, there, there is never a marriage that you should stay in when there's abuse and, and, and violence in it. No chance. I'm not saying that you should stay in marriage for those sorts of things. And there are some people here who are fantastic single mums and single dads. And I could point you out, there are some people here who have done such an amazing job as a single parent raising your children. So I don't want you to think that I'm standing here now saying marriage is a bad thing because in some cases, it's a thing that you must do. You must get out of that sort of thing. But people don't guard it as they used to. My parents, the one thing my parents told me was that marriage is so important. Marriage is really tough. Marriage takes work, but you must work at it. It's not just a, it's don't make it blase. Can I say to the young people here today, if you've just been married, or you've just been engaged, or you're in a relationship now, work hard at it, cherish it. It's really important. Don't take it for granted. Don't take it easy. Work hard together. Make sure you make it number one. God didn't create men and women to be equal. He made them to complement each other, to work with one another and care for one another and to love one another. We weren't meant to be the same. It's not to say that one is more important or better than the other, but we are equally important and we complete one another. And that's the point of family. We are created to care for one another to teach and protect our children, to look out for one another and care for one another, help each other through heartaches, which will inevitably come. Is that a word? Inevitably come, that's it. And if the enemy can change and pervert how we see family, the next generation is weaker for it. Now, here's the good news. I know that was pretty, uh, after such a great worship, but the great news is, as born again, God is so interested in family. As I said, it was his plan from the, from the very start. And as born again believers in Christ, we have been adopted into his family. This is your family in God. And for people whose biological families have let them down, this is really good news. God didn't put us on the planet to look after number one. He didn't put it on the planet to take care of ourselves. God put us here to take care of others first and be cared for by others. God wants to raise good children who surpass and succeed. However, there are responsibilities of being in a family. We've been talking about a healthy church for the start, from the start of the year and a healthy church starts with God's family. If you come here to expect to receive, you're not really going to fit into the family. But if you come here thinking, that little bit I have, I want to give to other people, then you know that God is going to bless you beyond anything you could imagine. Just turning the page. Now, when I say that God's going to bless you beyond anything you could imagine, this isn't a prosperity gospel I'm talking about. I'm not saying that you can manipulate God and you can say, well, I'm giving this and so God's going to give me that. It's not about that. God sees your heart. God sees what's really inside of you. You cannot trick God. 
he will not be tricked. In Galatians 6, 6 and 10, it said, that, let the one who has taught the word share all good things with the one who teaches. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from flesh reap corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary in doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially those in the household of faith. God is talking about us doing good for his people in the church, his church. A healthy church looks after the needs of others, cares for others and loves others. What you sow, you will reap. In Exodus 16, we know the story that the Israelites have left the slavery of Egypt and they're getting into the wilderness and they're grumbling and moaning because they haven't got enough to eat, they haven't got enough to drink. And they're saying, we would have been better being in, in Egypt where at least we had food to eat. We never went hungry, we always had meat, we always had bread. And God hears them, hears them moaning. So God spoke to Moses and said that his herd is there whinging, so I'm going to do this for the sooks. And in verse 13, that's not in the Bible, that was me. <laughs> in verse 13, we pick it up, it says, In the evening quail came up and covered the camp, and in the morning dew lay around the camp. And when the dew had gone up, there was on the face of the wilderness a fine flake-like thing, finest frost on the ground. And when the people of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given us to eat. This is what the Lord has commanded. Gather, gather of it, each one of you, as much as you can eat. You shall each take an omer, according to the number of the persons that each of you has in his tent. And the person of, people of Israel did so. They gathered some, some more, some less. But when they measured it with an omer, whoever gathered much had nothing left over, and whoever gathered little had no lack. Each of them gathered as much as they could eat. And Moses said to them, Let no one leave any over, sorry, any of it over till the morning. But they didn't listen to Moses. They left part of it till the morning, and, the bread, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as they could. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. It's such an important point of that story. You know, God gives unequally in talents to people. Some can do more, some a little less. You know, in this story it says that some gathered heaps and some gathered less, but no one went hungry. The point of your talent is to give to the people in the church. Some people have a bigger capacity to do, but everybody should get the same amount. It says if you have a talent, you have a gift, and you keep it to yourself, it'll rot and become stinky. You don't want the gift that God's given you to become rotten and stinky because you hold it to yourself. You want to give of that gift and God will bless you with more that you can give more. The whole point of it was that. It was about caring for one another. That's what the family of God should be doing. I can look out here and see people who have 10 times the ability that I have and they give of things. Everybody has different talents and gifts. Don't hold it and keep it to yourself. Give it out. Give it to other people. Otherwise, it's going to rot and it's going to come stinky and it'll be no good to anybody. But if we give of the little that we've got, God will bless everybody. And that is really important. And it's not just in that area. It's in every area of your life. You need to be generous with your time. If you do things only to benefit yourself, the things of God, the, the family of God, won't be as important anymore to you. Same as your finances. If you're all you're concerned about is with keeping it for yourself and having enough for a rainy day, it'll eventually hold your bondage and you'll become a slave to it. We need to give what God gives into the family to help grow that family. We are to be good stewards of what God has given us. We are not to be selfish or self-seeking. 1 Peter 4, 10 says, As each has gathered a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of varied grace. And again in Timothy 1, 58, uh, sorry, 5 to 8, it says, But if anybody does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. The work is for the body. Gather for all. Don't keep it for yourself because there are responsibilities for being part of a family. We need to care for one another. We need to support one another. 
We need to help one another and we need to provide and protect one another. Even when we don't want to, we do it because we're, that's what being in a family is all about. And the rewards are out of this world. In God's family, the rewards are being forgiven for the things that we have done. But better than that, they're also forgotten because he has loved us unconditionally. Psalm 103, 10, 13. He does not deal with us according to our sins nor repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love towards those who fear him. And as far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. Our father shows compassion to his children. Sorry, as a father shows compassion for his children, so the Lord shows compassion for those who fear him. God does not keep account of the things that we've done wrong. They will never be held against us again. When we lay down our life, when we ask God for forgiveness, he forgets the things you've done. It's an amazing part of what being in God's family is about and we need to do that for everybody else. You know, my mum and dad, I can tell you right now, love me more than they probably should have. I had done plenty wrong as a young lad and they continued to love me and they forgave me. My mum right now has dementia and I go to see my mum and she has no idea who I am. Has not the faintest idea, but she remembers every bad thing I did. <laughs> every bad thing I did. It's in there. She forgave me, but she never forgot it. While she can't remember anything in her life at the moment, that stays in her mind. And our father is not like that at all. We do so many things wrong in life. We do so many things in the body that are wrong and are hurtful to people. And our God just loves us so much. He can never remember it because he's forgiven it and forgotten it. It's an incredible thing. My life, I know in my life I've moved on from hurts in the past, but it only takes the slightest reminder of that thing, that person, that issue that brings it back up again and I fire up and oh. And then I don't see that person, that thing again for a while and it goes away again and then it comes back. I had an issue in my life where I couldn't forgive someone for something and it ate at me every day. I couldn't do anything about it. It wasn't until I actually had true forgiveness where I forgave the person and allowed myself to move on that I was able to move on because I no longer had that hurt in me. To be a healthy family, we need to learn to let go and give it to God. As Joe told us, we need to put it on, God, on God's uh, debt, put it on his account, and then we dust it off and move on. True forgiveness is releasing, and we need to let go of it. God's family is one of rest restoration if you let it. The rewards are amazing. I told you before that when I came to this church, I was a very broken person. I was in ministry as a pastor. I came here hurt and disappointed with life. And really, honestly, before you, I was disappointed with God. I thought, why would you allow this to happen? And I came to this church as a very broken person after trying a couple more churches before this. And we came here thinking, well, if this doesn't work, this is the last time we're coming to church. And I'm going to say this again, but I want to, wanted to make a point. When we came here, we met the Tripodis, we met the Washingtons, and we met the Habermills. And these guys became our we. These guys became our family. Lockie touched on it last week. We were in a family for over 20 years, came here so broken, thinking, what have we done? I'm thinking, what have you done, God? Why have you done this to us? Why would you rip us out of our family and bring us to a place we don't know? And we met the Washingtons, the Tripodis, and the Habermills, and these guys became our we. They had our back. God's family is where you make it and where you let it. This family saved us. This family restored us. This family protected us, and this family helped me back into my calling in God, which is an amazing thing. And our family continues to grow and all our unique talents and giftings are there to help others along the way. The longer we stayed in this family, we made more family members. We made the Brutons, the Knowles, the Kings, the Crouchers, the Boxalls. All these people became important in our lives to help us grow. I remember Pastor Kevin, he was instrumental in playing a part in my life by his unwavering care for me and looking up and believing for me. 
And then as we keep going in this family, some of our old family members rock up to help us. We have Glyn, who helped raise my children 20-something years ago, where today they still call him Uncle Glyn. Glyn played an important part of restoration because he's a part of the family of God. And the one I know I'm going to cry about is the guy next to him, my old mate Uncle John. When a 19-year-old lunatic gets saved and goes to a home group at a bloke's house and he teaches you what a Christian is, what it means to change your life. I could never thank him enough. He doesn't think he does a good job. But I stand here because he was my we. When I was 19 years old and needed Jesus, he stood there and showed me who Jesus was. The point of showing these photos is that no matter what your family you have here on earth, whether it's good or bad, all these photos of people is we're us doing life together. It changed everything. Doing life together with people, you find your we, you find your we in God's family. And that changes everything. We came broken. We stand here today whole and complete because if I look around this crowd and it's not just the guys I mentioned, we all become family and we all become our we. You need to be intentional in the lives of others. You need to find your we who are based in Christ. Family, sorry, when you find your we who are based in Christ, in Christ's family, you know that someone has always got your back and help you release you into everything that God has called for you. Not only that, they'll also help you lay 60 square metres of paving <laughs> and won't be able to walk the next day, which is really good. Here's the thing that means the most to me about my we, about God's family. I couldn't show you that photo if it wasn't for my we. I couldn't show you that my oldest son made it to church. Comes to Father's Day, knows Jesus because of my we, because of what God has done in my life because people prayed and believed and kept him in their hearts and prayed for him because they wanted to see God make a difference in his life. I can't show you that photo if you guys didn't do it. The family of God is so important. I know that people have really tough lives. But if you get into God's family, he'll restore you. He'll release you into everything you've ever wanted, what he wants you to do. Can the band come up before I cry anymore? (laughs) Your family here on earth may have let you down. May have done things that are too despicable to talk about. Or maybe as you've grown older, you don't feel the need for family anymore. Can I tell you? You'll never be released and grow into all that God's got for you if you don't come to his family. You were set free because you gave your heart to Jesus and by that adoption, you are now in his family. Believe it, move in it. Can I encourage you, if you have trust issues with family, please come forward and have some prayer today. God's family should be loving, kind and caring. A healthy church happens when we give it to God and let his idea of family take control of his life. I was up the front here today, this morning uh, worshipping. It was amazing. The Spirit of God was here. There are people here today who are so broken because of family issues. The Holy Spirit today, God today, wants to change your life, wants to make it new, wants to make it right, wants to set you free from things today. The Holy Spirit is here to do that. There are people here today who may be Hold offence to family. Maybe today you need to fix that. Maybe today you need to go and see that family member or ring that family member and tell them that you're sorry or tell them that you love them or tell them that you forgive them. Maybe you just can't do that today. So maybe you need to be praying for them. God's family is here to set us free. If you're born again today, you're in that family. If you have trust issues and it's holding you back from everything that God's got for you, get around your family. Find your we, work with one another, help one another out and be set free and be everything that God has called you to be.